So let's go to our plenary session. Mm, we, we have invited speaker, Dr. Martin Paul Eve. Uh, he's a senior lecturer in literature, technology, and publishing at uh, Birkbeck, University of London. In addition to his work on uh, contemporary fiction, he is the author of uh, Open Access and the Humanities, Context, Controversies, uh, uh, and the Future, what was published by Cambridge University Press last year, and the founder and co-director uh, of the Open Library of Humanities. So, please, Dr. Martin Pauli. Okay, can everyone hear me? Yes, you can. That's very loud. Excellent. Thank you very much for having me here at Lieber, which I assume is pronounced Lieber and not LIBOR, like some banking scandal, but um, we'll leave it at that. Um, you should never start by apologizing either, but I'm, I'm going to do two quick apologies that I'm full of cold and slightly unwell. So it, it was all really logical inside here, and then it went through the cold, and I hope it comes out in some kind of order at the other end. The other thing is that some of you looking around the audience will have seen parts of this presentation before. Um, so if you get really bored of those parts, there is new material. This uh, amazing plant behind me can provide a suitable distraction and you can contemplate that instead. Uh, the other thing that I'll just say up front is that the book that was just mentioned is available open access from Cambridge, of course, because I'm not a total hypocrite. Um, and if you'd like to read that, the URL is now on this first page. You can also buy a copy for £12 and the proceeds go to Arthritis Research UK, my royalties. So that might be good as well. But anyway. So I'm going to talk today about open access in the humanities disciplines, how it's different to some of the scientific disciplines, what those challenges are, both economic and social, and what we might do to fix it in general and also in the one specific project that I work on. Uh, it's worth saying up front, I'm going to do some recap of general concepts around open access because actually the debate has become muddled. People say gold open access and they refer to a business model when they do that, which was never in the original definition. And when we think about the humanities disciplines, we may need to go back to the very basics of what we're talking about, particularly with the economics, because it doesn't translate across different disciplinary spaces. So when we talk about open access, I know we've also had debate around the degree of permissiveness that might be in this space. But what I mean when I say open access is freely available, peer-reviewed research that is online and is free to reuse with certain conditions. Attribution is one of those conditions that can be limiting the amount of reuse allowed, but there must be some kind of additional permission at least to redistribute. Some have taken that to mean that CC BY is the only acceptable license. I don't go that far. I think in a pragmatic transition space, we need to be more liberal on that. When we talk about gold open access, what we mean is that the publisher is doing it. We're talking about a journal or a book publisher making the material open access at source. We're not talking about article processing charges or book processing charges, although those are quite clearly the most obvious way in which a publisher can recoup their revenue if they haven't got a source from subscriptions. Green open access, by contrast, refers, of course, to those instances where researchers deposit in an institutional repository. And the great thing about green open access, there are some bad things about green open access, but the great thing is that at the moment there's no evidence that it causes subscription cancellations, which means that publishers are quite happy to let us do it for now. I think that will change over time, and we've seen recent moves from Elsevier in the last month or so to restrict this. But at the moment, the argument we need to make is that green open access is positive, even though it's sustained by unsustainable subscriptions, and that it normalizes practices of openness across many disciplines. So as a transitionary measure, green is really valuable. We then have two terms in open access that we'll use to talk about degrees of permissiveness. Gratis simply means that the work is free to read. And I'll talk about why there are problems with that restriction later, but it's nonetheless a step in the right direction. If, though, you apply an open license to your work, one of the Creative Commons licenses, for example, then we would call that work Libra, because additional permissions beyond those enshrined in fair dealing are also available. So that's the matrix, gold, green, gratis, Libra. And that's enough jargon on that slide, but now we're all on the same page. Now, the interesting thing about the humanities disciplines is that they, are, they have been, in policy discussions, more reticent to embrace open practices. There's obviously an embattled logic of these disciplines. I come from one of them. I'm an English literature um, lecturer, where we feel under threat from funding cuts in particular. 
And this translates, when we talk about open practices, into the sciences once again forcing us to do their practices in their way without any say. And this looks like an easy place to mount a resistance from the humanities. So we've seen that from time to time. And it's also true that the history of open access is rooted in certain types of scientific practice. For example, computer science has a strong background here, with Richard Storman drafting the GNU public license in 1989, first viral copyleft license there that spreads throughout that system is applied to open source software. We see Larry Lessig, a Harvard lawyer, extend that logic to the Creative Commons around 2002. But I think also we should think about the history of the humanities in these spaces, because it is strong, but it's just always underplayed. So, for example, the original Budapest Open Access Declaration was drafted by Peter Suber, who is a philosopher of epistemology by training, and now obviously head of the Harvard Open Access Project. We also know that there has been a range of experiments across the humanities disciplines where open access journals have been started by faculty. And indeed, I'd say it's the case now that whenever humanities faculty approach a new project, doing it themselves rather than going through a publisher, open is the default. You don't go to start an online digital project because you want to paywall it. You go there because you want the infinite dissemination that's offered by the internet. Now that can mean that these projects often don't have a sustainable footing. There's often not a business model behind them and sometimes they fold. But it does show that there's not an incompatibility between open practice online and the humanities disciplines. So I'd say there are formal and informal histories of open access in the humanities, but nonetheless, if you think that there is progress towards open access, the humanities are far further behind as it currently stands. Indeed, rates of institutional deposit for the humanities disciplines are, on the whole, much lower than their scientific counterparts. Although I don't think it's fair to treat the humanities and sciences as blocks. Chemistry, for example, has a really low rate of deposit. Philosophy has quite a high rate of deposit. But if you average them out, you do see that difference there. We also have the problem, though, of economics. So beyond various social resistances, the humanities disciplines have a different economic structure for purchasing serial subscriptions and monographs in these spaces. As a broader point, though, the scholarly communications economic setup is a complete mess as far as I'm concerned. We've built a circular structure that doesn't look anything like a market, but yet politicians, publishers, and libraries are supposed to participate in this as though it is an ideal market, as though all the players in this system have perfect rational access to information about what they're doing and act on that basis. But it's simply not true. There are multiple economies overlapping on top of each other here. So, for example, researchers are known to give their work to publishers as part of their process of accreditation and dissemination. But there's two different things going on there when I give my work to a publisher. Of course I want it published for dissemination, but I also need it for my hiring, for my promotion, for the material benefits that I get. In other words, I'm not expecting the publisher to remunerate me as a researcher. I'm expecting to get a symbolic return that does translate into a material return for me in my professional space, but it's a different type of economy on top of this. I also, I mean, I'm saying I here, this is perhaps not true. I do think about these things, but I, as a traditional humanities researcher, am also not worried at all about how much it costs the library to subscribe to the publication where I am placing my work. So there's a disjunct between that thinking in the economics. At the same time, we have different categories of publishing, publisher faring very differently under this economic system. Some publishers, the ones that we always pick on at open access conferences, are doing very well indeed. We know about Elsevier's enormous profit margins in the sciences. We can name the big five commercial publishers who take the lion's share of now article processing charges, but previously subscriptions as well. But at the other end of the spectrum, there are a range of mission-driven publishers, often focusing extensively on monographs in the humanities, university presses, for example, who are one lawsuit away from bankruptcy. So this system is a very strange way of seeing two poles. We have profiteers and we have the precariat. And it's easy to lump publishers into one group as well, but I don't think that's quite the whole picture there either. And finally, we have libraries in this economic cycle who are torn between the demands of researchers to provide access to material, while at the same time being threatened by eight representatives to one from those profiteers and realising they have to support the mission-driven presses and finding that their budgets have been cut in material terms. 
could cite the well-known ARL statistics about the 300% above inflation rise in subscription costs since 1986 as evidence of that. Uh, but we could also think on the ground about the problems of access with students and retention and how that feeds into teaching cycles now. In fact, it's really interesting to think about how the library's role now has to be the front-facing element of research provision for students who come and are a primary income source now in the UK. So I think fears about the library going away are overblown, but nonetheless, it's a different kind of role and the financial pressures are not going away tomorrow. So we have this economic setup that means that we can't get access. The other thing that the current system doesn't do well for us is that it doesn't let us reuse material in ways that are beneficial for the academy itself. So we also pay licenses for photocopying material to which we have already subscribed under the current setup. We know that text mining and derivatives in some jurisdictions remain prohibited, even if we have passed legislation to amend that in the UK. We have a problem reaching out to those valuable resources that are consumed by many publics, such as Wikipedia. Yes, we can cite work under fair dealing, but what might we get if we were able to include articles wholesale in that space? Surely this is a benefit to our disciplines in the humanities, where we're becoming invisible compared to the open access sciences. And last but not least, we've had a lot of critique in the humanities of English as the dominant language. You know, this is a colonial legacy that this has become the international uh, lingua franca of academic discourse. But yet we don't let anyone translate our work. We retain copyright or sign it over and devolve that to the market, which strikes me as equally problematic. So we need some form of reuse. And lastly, as I started to hint at there, we have this problem that the public are denied access to humanities material. We have an increasingly educated populace Vast number of people come through our walls every year in the university, humanities departments especially, but then they leave and they have no access to continue engaging with the work that we hope they found engaging while they were here. Well, that strikes me that all the institution is doing there is becoming a system for deferring employment and incurring debt over three years. How can we claim that these humanities disciplines are fostering critical thinking over a life if that's all you get? It's a pedagogy of debt. We teach you where your place is in society, in debt to banks, student financing systems, and then how can you think critically? So my worry is that without some kind of open practice, these disciplines really suffer disproportionately because there is no utilitarian aspect. It's obvious what medicine does for us, although I wish they could sort out my cold. Um, it's not obvious what the humanities do. There is no obvious we cure cancer kind of line there. So if we're invisible, we mean virtually nothing. So the most obvious way in which many publishers have sought to implement open access is by flipping the business model in a gold sense. If you can't make money from selling because it's not an exclusive commodity good, so why would you pay for it if you're not getting something exclusively, then we will charge authors from the other side. And that's fine. It's not a business model that is linked to problems in peer review necessarily. I don't agree that predatory publishing is a huge problem. I think that that is overstated um, by a particular member of the library community for personal reasons. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to have a drink at that point. Um, and actually, I think the victims of that are usually poorly advised graduate students or researchers from developing countries who want to buy in to the, the Western Anglophone research culture. That's not to say that isn't a problem, and there are people who do that, but I'm not aware of a single, say, Welcome Trust APC being spent in a predatory venue. So the argument that making the funding available means that these venues prosper doesn't seem to make sense to me. But there's a different problem with article processing charges, and that pertains to disciplines where the costs are different and the levels of revenue available are different. So the first thing to stress about the humanities disciplines is that we tend not to have the journals that are priced as extortionately as the top end of the science spectrum. We don't have the multi-tens of thousand dollar journals to purchase, which makes the subscription ecosystem look a bit different. By contrast, though, we don't have the money locally for article processing charges. And I just want to talk a bit about how article processing charges tend to concentrate costs. So subscriptions create an access gap, and that's a problem. But they do do one thing really well, which is they spread costs among a huge number of institutions. So no single institution pays the whole cost of the labor that went into producing an article or an issue of a journal. 
and that's a good way of spreading risk and cost. When you switch to a model of article processing charges, though, what you're saying is that an institution must bear the total cost per article. And this pans out very differently when you model it across institutions. And I've got three sample institutions that I've modeled here. One, uh, these are actually representing departments in the UK. So one is a department of 10 researchers in an English department with a budget of £3,770 for subscriptions every year. That's it. And I'm serious, I know that figure is correct because I've worked at that institution. So in a model where you have article processing charges for that institution at the going market rate of approximately £1,500 or so or scaling up to $3,000, what does it look like? Well, the second question we need to ask before we can answer that is, what are we expecting researchers to produce? And in this country, we're expecting every researcher to produce four pieces of work to be submitted to the Research Excellence Framework every five years. So we have a minimum quantity of output if we were going to flip the business model entirely that we know we should pay for. So we can model this over a five-year period against subscriptions and see what it looks like. And in all of these cases, I've just scaled this up across different institutions, so a department of 10 and then 20 and then 30, and I've actually been more generous to the bigger departments and given them a higher spend per researcher. But what you can see in each case is that it's only with an article processing charge of below £800 in the bigger institutions where you start to see this being cheaper than subscriptions over a five-year period. And that's assuming that you didn't pay any subscription costs at the same time, which is a total nonsense because we're all going to have to pay extra during a transition phase. In other words, while what we've got in the sciences and in some funded humanities spaces looks sustainable as it currently stands, i.e. we can continue to pay for it at that level, I can't see how it scales to universality, and the transition phase is particularly painful. So that's some of the concerns I have about article processing charges and cost concentration in the journal space. The second problem is that journals only form part of the humanities ecosystem. And if we want open practice in totality, we need to continue monographs, or books, as they're commonly known to uh, everyone else outside our jargon-ridden fields. Long-form writing, I think, was how Hefke phrased it in a recent uh, publication. Monographs are acknowledged as different in various ways. For example, the Hefke mandate in the UK for REF 2020, or REF whenever it is, um, will be excluding long-form writing. Anything without an ISSN doesn't have to feature in that green mandate. And the reason for this is that there are higher barriers to entry for new publishers, it's harder for a market space to emerge here, and so the economics look very different. We know the costs are very different, so Palgrave charges £11,000, $16,000 for a monograph. Well, if you couldn't find £1,500 for a journal article, just which dean do you think will be laughing at me if I try to ask for £11,000? Likewise, we know that this market space is harder to enter for new participants because the open source platform is in its infancy. Do-it-yourself book publishing is much harder from a technological standpoint, but it's also harder from a social standpoint. Researchers need that symbolic return, and going to a press with a name is the way, unfortunately, that we've chosen to measure that. And that, again, isn't going away tomorrow, no matter how many institutions sign DORA or whatever. Researchers will continue to compensate for the fact they don't have enough labor time by using shorthands such as publisher brand. No researcher also has a second book in their drawer that they can just give to an open access publisher in order to boost the movement. We all need to spend five years working on these and then get the maximum return we can from them. So it's a very different and difficult space. And the last thing I'll say is that there are, there's a slight problem with trade crossover books. Uh, a popular historian's best route to achieving widespread dissemination is not necessarily to put their manuscripts solely online. They need to appear in Waterstones, so the bookshops on the high street, alongside their radio program, TV tie-in, perhaps. And that means they may be working with trade publishers who don't understand this environment at all. If you can't get an academic publisher to do an open access volume, you stand no chance of getting Penguin or a high street brand to do it. They'll say, ha, that's catastrophic for our business model. So problems abound in the monograph space. So this is where I tell you a little bit about what I've been building to address some of these problems. I'm not going to pretend this is the only solution. I think it's great that there are a range of experiments, and I'll mention some of them as we go through here. But I'm going to tell you about what we're doing. 
And this is called the Open Library of Humanities, which is a solution to some of the problems in the journal space for the humanities that I've been talking about. It's a mega journal, it's a multi-journal, it's not for profit, and it's collectively funded. Um, I'm gonna unpack that a little bit now. So this is a little bit of the topology of the project here. We have a new mega journal that is transdisciplinary. It's the bottom box demonstrated on this uh, setup here. It's not a mega journal in the plus one sense of lowering the criteria of peer review or lowering or, or changing them to technical soundness because we're not entirely sure what that looks like in the humanities. What does it mean to go for technical soundness? Well, yes, a piece would have an argument, it would have all the scholarly apparatus, it would reference everything in the field, but actually we do need novelty in these disciplines because otherwise you're thinking the same as someone else. Replication studies have a very different context in many fields of humanities work. So we have a new mega journal, but we also have the ability for journals to migrate onto our platform away from their existing publishers. And I'll talk about why that's beneficial when I come on to the economics shortly. We have six journals coming on board for launch and the mega journal, pu publishing approximately 150 articles in our first year. The other great thing about, well, as far as I'm concerned, great thing about this platform is that we're building the ability for editors to curate material between spaces within the journals. So this is designed to say, if you value an editor, then they should be able to flag to your attention material that was peer reviewed elsewhere. And this is an attempt to move away from the journal brand as the ultimate arbiter of quality because that's really economically damaging and traps us with the existing publishers. Value the labor that went into it, the editors, the peer reviewers and so forth, and let them signal quality. So in a sense, these are overlay journals. In a sense, they're just journals. And we spent a long time trying to broach the problem of prestige in this space. I spoke about how it's difficult for new publishers. It's no different in journals. It's just a, a lower barrier than monographs. So we have people from around the world who we consulted with for many, many months, people at Stanford, David Palumbo Liu, professor of history at Harvard, um, David Armitage, obviously big open access names like Peter Suber, Michael Eisen, and so forth, uh, Kathleen Fitzpatrick at the MLA. And from that, we collectively decided what it was we needed to build. And now, actually, we're currently inundated with journal submissions, and we're going to be putting those to a board decision next year. That's great, so how do you fix the economics? What's the funding unicorn that might make this possible? Well, the current system looks a little bit like this, uh, where the uh, signs there are libraries, not restrooms. And <laughs> Good, got the joke, it's still awake. Um, we currently have a system where many hundreds or thousands of libraries are all paying moderate to large sums in order that we can erect paywalls, because things have to be exclusive, we're told, if you pay for them. But I contend that actually that isn't how our library economics work in some ways. We know that if a colleague at an institution down the road doesn't have access to a journal, our librarians are quite happy to package that up, post it off, they can pay the cost of postage from the other side, and let them have it on interlibrary loan. So we already have a system where free riders are tolerated. It's just not as extreme, perhaps, as in the online world. And our model is simply to invert this, much like archive, a little bit like knowledge unlatched, where a relatively large number of libraries, we are coming approaching 100 at the moment, pay small sums into a central fund so that we can remunerate the labor of publishing for anything that passes peer review. In other words, researchers don't have to find APCs themselves. It comes from a central fund because the library community recognized the value in funding it in this way and spreading risk in exactly the same way as subscriptions, albeit we're cheaper than subscriptions. Libraries are given a governance stake in the project, so when a new journal comes to us and wants to join, it has to be sanctioned by our academic board who say, yes, we want that, that's high quality, it should be on the platform. And then the libraries between them have to vote to raise the subscription next year by the amount needed. In that way, libraries get to control the rate of transition between themselves. And obviously, we don't expect a unanimous vote to come through in each case, and we will negotiate with subgroups when that happens. But I'm going to show you a little bit of how those economics pan out. So this is a comparison per article per institution with a Journal of American Studies, one published by an American university press and one published by an American commercial publisher. And Journal A is the commercial uh, is the commercial publisher, Journal B is the university press publisher. 
And the first thing I, I think I wish to point out here is how much cheaper the university press publisher is for libraries than the commercial publisher. So support university press publishers even in a subscription mode. They're not trying to screw us over quite so badly. Um, on the other hand, though, if we can reach 350 libraries and wanted to publish 250 articles, we'd only need $528 from each to be able to do that, which is $2.11 per institution per article. Spreading the cost in this way on a not-for-profit basis actually turns out to be extremely economical. We also have, as I said, subscription journals leaving their current publishers to join us, which makes for a direct offsetting mechanism here. So, for example, a, a journal that wants to join us next year currently costs £50 uh, for a library to subscribe. I told you these figures are not as big often in the humanities. It publishes 10 articles per year. It's not huge, but it's definitely valued by a niche scholarly community, and they want you to continue to pay for it. If we do it through our system with 100 libraries, it comes out at £35 per year per article. So it's open access, and it's already £15 cheaper per year. And if more libraries join, it gets cheaper for every library participating. In other words, this scales, and it's got a transition mechanism built into it. So, so far, as I said, we're approaching 100 libraries, including the Galileo Consortium, uh, consisting of the entirety of the state of Georgia. Uh, we're funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation um, for our initial period. Uh, some big names I've listed on there. The Wellcome Trust has participated in this as well. Um, there were many nights when I thought it would never work and that I was wasting my life trying it. I'm pretty sure it is going to work now. We've got a critical mass and it's rolling forward. I'm going to wrap up there because I expect we'd like to have a conversation about this and no one really minds if you speak for three minutes shorter than the time you were allocated. Coffee is beckoning at some point. Thank you very much for listening. I hope that was interesting. Thank you, Dr. Reeve. Right now, we do have time for questions, and we do have mics. Please use mics if you um, ask your question. So, please. Yes, please. Uh, should I wait for the mic? Yes, wait for the mic, please. It's coming. Um, a very short question. You didn't mention scholarly societies. Societies are hard work because they derive their revenue often, especially in the bigger cases, from publishing activities. And that creates a very strange feedback loop again, like the one that I first posited, where um, essentially we have money in institutions and we have scholars in institutions who have banded together to form a group across institutions. And by funding societies through publication, we're actually asking for library budgets for research to be used to fund interdisciplinary activities for the researchers at our own institutions. Now, I think that's a really stupid way of funding research. It doesn't mean that I have an easy answer to that problem overnight. What I am doing is seeking funding for a project where over five years we could give a group of societies exactly the same revenue that they currently receive from publishing if they will transition to an open access model. They have to, though, present a business plan up front to be vetted by an international panel of experts for how they will move to a different funding model. The other thing is that some societies in the humanities don't derive any revenue from their publishing and, in fact, are paying publishers. So those are an easy win, and those are the societies that are coming to us already. And I think a pincer movement on those two types, so bring on board the small societies who don't have that revenue problem, while finding a way that we could pilot some bigger societies to move to alternative models will give us a way in which we can work with societies to pursue open access that I think is directly in line with their mission to advance their disciplines. Yes, please. There's a lady in red. Thank you. Um, I enjoyed your comment about the problem with gold and the terminology of gold. Um, it's a problem I'm encountering as well. Um, I'm wondering whether it's better to use terminology, and I can't credit this because I can't remember where I saw it, but the idea of born open access and secondary open access. Because green and gold, gold implies best, gold implies money, and it's been appropriated. And so <coughs> it's probably time for us to claim back the language and use alternative terms. I think the terminology is really problematic, uh, mostly because 
researchers don't care about open access itself, let alone the layers of jargon we then put on top of it. And of course, any intellectual subfield has to have its distinguishing terminologies, and it's useful for those of us speaking about it. But I also agree it's become not so useful. If even in a room full of open access advocates I can, I can speak and I say gold, and some people misinterpret what I've said there. So I'm hesitant to say we need new terminologies or new discourses to wrap on top of what we've already got. And I think we probably just need to clarify and show ways we can do this. But at the moment, there aren't really many gold projects that have stature that don't have APCs. So perhaps that is part of the problem, even though the DOAJ shows a large number of journals that are gold open access that don't have fees. So it might just be a matter of marketing, or maybe we do need new terms. I'm split. That's called sitting on the fence for an answer, by the way. So the next question is here in the front row. <coughs> Marco Baguer from Göttingen University. Um, I really like the dilemma for humanities scholars that you put in a nutshell, that they don't have a second book to pull out to foster open access, which means to me that if they don't have a second book, then we need to bring the first and the second book together. What kind of recommendations do you have to move the publishers that s claim that they can't pick up open access? So. When we initially put this together, we had books in the proposal with a partnership with Cambridge, Oxford, and Harvard University Press. We've pulled back from that slightly at this stage. It's not something off the cards. It's just that we need to build the economic model for what we're doing before we could go ahead with that. And essentially, that consortium worked exactly like Knowledge Unlatched, saying, libraries who are participating, do you want to spread the book processing charge essentially among you? And that means that the existing publishers, yes, it's, it's kind of conservative and normative in a way because those existing publishers are just being given revenue to continue rather than finding ways to bring costs down. But I just don't think we'll broach that symbolic problem that researchers need to go to those presses overnight. And so finding a way that we pay the title charges that they want is vital. Individual institutions don't seem to me to be able to do that. So it's got to be done by groups of institutions in a kind of collective consortial purchasing model. And there are problems, of course, with selection procedures there. How do you stop it devolving into a big deal bundle once again? On the other hand, these things are then open. It's, it's just a, a prisoner's dilemma at this initial stage. Get over the catch-22, I'm mixing metaphors frantically here, and you'll actually get to a place where open access is accepted, new presses can break into that space. Next question comes from the middle of auditory. Oh, um, so is there an issue about not exposing the cost of the APC to actually the, the authors in terms of making a more effective market, which is ultimately what we want? I think they're two different issues. I don't think scholarly communications can be a market in some ways as it currently stands because there's no substitute for a piece of research work. So certainly in a subscription mode, there's no other piece of work I could turn to instead if I want to pay a different price from a different provider. I need that piece of research which is owned by that publisher because they signed the copyright agreement. So it doesn't work as a market there. If it was a service driven market from APCs, perhaps then different places giving different services or brand provision might, there might be a market emerging. But I query whether that ever happens because the symbolic drive is so strong. It's like trying to start your own trainer company against Nike overnight. And you, you can produce something that's 10 times better. It doesn't really matter because everyone wants the cool of Nike, the symbolic capital. In terms of exposing researchers to the costs, we do tell researchers on the first step of our submission that there were costs involved in this. This is what it was. You can only publish here for free because this group of libraries are funding it behind the scenes. And I do think, yeah, ideally, okay, so when, when the Finch report first came out, it looked devastating for uh, research in the humanities. They thought, we cannot get this funding. And I was over the moon in some ways, because suddenly they realized the scope of the serials crisis and what libraries have been facing day to day. On the other hand, that's not going to get us to getting open content, which is what we need, because we need it to become ingrained that you expect your work to be openly available on the internet. So in the long run, yes, I think researchers should be much more engaged with knowing about the economics that structure their libraries and their 
means of production. It's important we expose them to that. In the short term, I'm happy to take the compromise route of telling them there are costs but not making them bear them or really think about it in any very personal way just so we actually get somewhere towards open access in these disciplines. Uh, back there, <coughs> uh, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, are you aware of the Open Edition French project and uh, to what extent the business model would differ from uh, the Open Edition? Sure, yeah, of course I'm aware of Open Edition and it's a completely admirable project. Um, I spoke with, I think, Marin a while back on this. The primary th thing that I've seen different in Open Edition is pursuing the freemium model there, but also the French language bias obviously is, is heavy in that space. They're not dissimilar in their membership model sometimes, and there's some overlap, and eventually it could be that the projects see some kind of convergence. For now, though, we've targeted heavily the Anglo-American Academy, the centers of prestige that have been resisting open access heavily and worked in those spaces to build a presence. So we don't have a freemium model built into what we're doing at the moment, like open edition. We're working on the library basis, and we're working on converting existing journals onto this platform. Yes, please. Um, Jean-Claude Gaydon said recently that he believed the future was the sponsored mega journal. What, what do you think about that? Maybe not just in the humanities, but across the board, that he believed that should be the focus or the ultimate end game. I kind of believe that too, which is why we have a mega journal in our system. I, so the idea here with a mega journal is that we want to get away from brand in some ways of, of different venues competing and actually having a centralized function makes a lot of sense. We can be honest and upfront about the peer review. It's easier to manage and so forth. And you know, research can be out there in various scopes. The problem is that in a transition phase, there's again, that symbolic capital held by existing brand name journals is very, very strong. So PeerJ looks to be slowing down a bit. As far as I can see, there's the recent piece. Um, obviously, have they reached their capacity? Um, I think uh, you've probably seen that article circulating. Um, on the other hand, once you have those venues on board, making it clear that actually they could be stored in a back end in a mega journal and be front end overlays is something that is interesting. I mean, why, what is it that's unique about a journal? Well, it has its own peer review procedures and branding. But why does that mean it doesn't need to have the back end store just being a mega journal and the table of contents brought out and valued by the community who value that editor? So that's what we're working on is how do you get to that end game without making it central to your absolute philosophy like PeerJ or like PLOS One at the very start? Um, we'll see how well editors react to it. So far, you know, the more adventurous have said, yes, that's brilliant. Okay, we'll just run an overlay. We'll just we'll scrap our existing journal management system and just be part of that as long as we can be the editors who handle it in the mega journal. Others have said, well, we'll see how it goes. So we have four minutes for questions. Do we have some more questions? Yes, please. The excitement is palpable, isn't it? Um, hello, thanks for an inspiring talk. I'm Pablo de Castro. I'm coordinating the uh, rolling out of the European Commission Gold Open Access Pilot on behalf of Liber and Open Air. Uh, we are particularly aware of uh, the fact that gold doesn't mean APCs in this project uh, and also aiming to strike a balance uh, across disciplines and countries if possible. Um, so I'd, I'd like to know more about uh, the uh, Open Library of Humanities. Uh, my first question about this would be, is this initiative uh, aiming to become a British-focused uh, um, platform or an English-language-focused platform in the midterm? Neither of those. Um, we already have submissions in, a mul in multiple languages coming into the mega journal. So, for example, we've got an Italian submission just going through copy editing at the moment. Um, we have broad, uh, broadly speaking, our support base so far has been in the States and the UK, but that's um, the original targets that we set out. We have some emergent partners in the Netherlands, for example, in Sweden, and we're very keen to talk to consortia across all those groups to work out whether we can enter into partnerships there. So I, I foresee this as a totally interlingual platform, intercultural platform, and in fact, part of our grant work, grant funded work over the next year is to build a community translation layer. 
so that researchers can translate pieces for each other using those benefits of open licensing. So this actually becomes about communication rather than just about publishing for accreditation and getting the dialogue going across different nations. So yes, absolutely. Yes, we have one question there. <coughs> Corinne Dominin, Université Paris-Sorbonne. Could you explain the part played by the Guardian newspaper? <laughs> the part played by the Guardian newspaper is that we had an article about the platform published in there. It was part of the demonstration of how we'd worked to actually see the social and symbolic problems as part of the things you have to do when you're launching a new initiative. It's not just enough ever to build it and they will come. You have to speak to researchers. You have to go through established media channels. And that was just my... Slide demonstration that we have been doing that. <laughs> I, wish, I wish I could say the Guardian newspaper was coming on board and we were going to support them because they do some great work and their finances aren't that great. But I, I don't think our model can quite bear that scope yet. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes, Vera. And this will be the last question. So make it good. <laughs> Saskia de Vries, I'm here for the Radboud University Nijmegen. Are you aware of the new open access Springer deal the Netherlands have uh, closed? No. Oh, <laughs> because I was want wanting to know what you think about it. <laughs> well, i tell you what, I, I better go read up on it and go get Ilko to tell me all about it so I'm not I'll so come and ignorant tell you on this. Later. Yeah, yeah okay. no, that would be brilliant. Thank okay. you. Thank you for questions and uh, let's show, uh, show our appreciation to Dr. Rio. Thank you.